Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on synaptic mechanisms. What I want to do in this video is uh, talk a little bit about the clamp theory, okay, uh, with relation to uh, sn the snare proteins used in neurotransmission, so the clamp theory. Now, the clamp theory is basically that um, to stop the snare complexes, uh, fusing the synaptic vesicle with uh, the plasma membrane, you need a protein called the clamp protein which holds the two membranes apart because if you don't have that, the snare complexes will just zip up and join uh, and fuse the uh, vesicle membrane of the synaptic vesicle with the plasma membrane. Okay, so in this video what I plan on doing is outlining that in a lot more detail and then um, talking about an experiment done by Rothman many years ago uh, that, back, well, that illustrates the need for this, um, a theory like this. Okay, and I want to stress that this uh, is a theory. It's a model. Uh, it may well be very wrong, and in 20 years' time we may know it's very wrong. At the moment, though, uh, it is a model that has weight behind it. There are a good many people uh, who are in this field who, uh, would, who believe in it. Okay, right. So, uh, let's discuss, um, well, let's firstly discuss how we dock synaptic vesicles at the plasma membrane, and then we'll discuss why we need the clamp theory in more detail. Okay, so let's say we have an axon terminal here. So this is an axon terminal. Okay, so an axon terminal here. Okay, now in the axon terminal, what we are producing is synaptic vesicles. Now, a synaptic vesicle means a normal vesicle which is full of neurotransmitter, okay? So there's lots of neurotransmitter molecules within this vesicle, okay? So that's what is meant by a synaptic vesicle. So this is a synaptic vesicle. Now, in order to actually release the neurotransmitter, um, neurotransmitter when an action potential comes along the axon here, what you need to have is these synaptic vesicles need to be docked at this uh, membrane of the axon terminal which faces the postsynaptic cell. So the postsynaptic cell is here, okay? Uh, so this portion of the membrane that faces the synaptic cleft, that faces uh, the uh, membrane of the postsynaptic cell which the neurotransmitter is going to act on, this is known as the active zone of the axon terminal. So this is the active zone. So what we need to do is we need to dock these synaptic vesicles on the active zone, i.e. they need to sit on the membrane basically, uh, not fuse with it yet, they need to sit um, next to the active zone and when an action potential comes along the axon and arrives at the axon terminal, we then need to fuse these vesicles with the membrane to release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Now, these vesicles, which are, um, which are docked or at the active zone, these are what are known as uh, the readily releasable vesicle pool. So this is the readily releasable vesicle pool. Okay, and they're called that because when uh, the action potential comes down the axon and arrives at the axon terminal, they will be released very, very quickly. I think it's the statistic is that they'll be released within 200 microseconds of the action potential arriving, basically. Okay, so we want to discuss in this video how do we dock vesicles at uh, the active uh, zone, and then how, when an action potential comes along, does it cause them to fuse, and what stops them from fusing prior to that, basically. Okay, so let's draw a bigger picture then. Let's draw our synaptic vesicle here, this vesicle which is full of neurotransmitter, out again here. So this is a synaptic vesicle, so it's a vesicle full of our neurotransmitter contents, which we'll just draw as pink dots here. Okay, right. So, in order for the synaptic vesicle to dock at the active zone of the presynaptic uh, axon terminal, uh, then we need proteins in the membrane of the uh, synaptic vesicle to bind to proteins in the uh, membrane of the presynaptic cell. And these proteins that are going to um, bind uh, to each other are known as snare proteins. Okay, 
So here's the plasma membrane, and the proteins that are going to be involved in docking the uh, synaptic vesicle on the plasma membrane are called snare proteins. And snare proteins stand for, snare stands for snap receptors, because all of these snare proteins bind to another protein known as snap. Okay, right, and this, uh, well, the um, snares can be divided broadly into two types of snares. The V-snares, or vesicular snares, which are associated with the vesicle here, so they're in the membrane of the vesicle, so let me just write this out, vesicle snares, or vesicular snares, okay, and then the other um, broad class are the ones which are attached to the plasma membrane, and those are called T snares. And the T in T snares stands for target snares, because in this case the plasma membrane is viewed as the target membrane uh, which the um, vesicle is going to fuse with, basically. So that's why it's called target snares. Okay, right, so let's actually look at uh, these snare proteins. So. In the membrane of the vesicle, you have a V-snare known as synaptobrevin. Uh, specifically, it's synaptobrevin 2. Okay, so this is the V-snare. This is the snare protein that is in the vesicular membrane, and this is synaptobrevin 2. Synaptobrevin 2. Right, now, synaptobrevin 2 structure is that it has a membrane spanning portion, and then it has an alpha helix here. And what's going to happen is this alpha helix is going to form a core snare complex with alpha helices from the T snares, basically. So you also have a T snare here, which will have a membrane spanning portion and then an alpha helix. And this T snare is known as syntaxin 1. Okay. So this protein here, this represents syntaxin 1, okay? And then finally, there's another T-snare, which is bound to the membrane, uh, and is a T-snare, therefore, which contributes two alpha helices. And uh, this, um, this snare is known as SNAP25. So these two alpha helices here, these are, this is SNAP25. Okay, so this is SNAP25. Alright, okay, so I want to um, firstly tell you what these things are doing together. Uh, so they're going to form a complex. These alpha helices are all going to wrap around each other and form a very sort of tight bundle with one another. Okay, now firstly what will happen is because syntaxin 1 and SNAP25 are in the same membrane together, long before the vesicle ever arrives, SNAP25 and syntaxin, they will form a complex with each other. The alpha helices will wrap around one another, and when the synaptic vesicle comes along and synaptobrevin 2 is supplied, then synaptobrevin 2 will join the fun and it will wrap around them as well. Okay, so uh, what um, the way that these um, well, actually, I should tell you what they're called first. This complex of snares here, this is known as a snare core complex. Okay, so a, or, or a core snare complex probably is better. Core snare complex. Okay, and the one that I've drawn specifically is what's known as a trans core snare complex. So trans core snare complex, and trans basically means a cross. So uh, the reason this is called a trans core uh, snare complex is that the um, the um, snare proteins aren't all in the same membrane. Synaptobrevin is in two is in a separate membrane from SNAP25 and syntaxin one. So you have the two snare proteins that are well, two different types of snare protein that are coming together uh, to form this core snare complex that are in opposing membranes, and that's why it's called the trans snare complex. And you could have all four of these proteins in a single membrane, and again, they'd still form a core snare complex. That would then be a cis uh, core snare complex, cis meaning on the same side. Okay, right, the other thing I want to discuss is another bit of notation that you will occasionally hear, which is you will hear synaptobrevin 2 occasionally referred to as an R snare, okay? 
and you will hear snap 25 and um, syntaxin 1, you will hear those two referred to as Q snares. Now, I want to discuss with you what this means, and unfortunately, R and Q do not just mean different ways of saying T and V snare. Uh, no, it's not as simple as that. Basically, there is a point along these four alpha helices where the alpha helices all interact with one another. They all have certain amino acids that form this sort of complex which holds the four um, alpha helices together. And the amino acid that's on synaptobrevin 2 at this point is an arginine, hence the R, which is the single letter amino acid code for arginine. And the amino acid that is, contributes to this structure in the case of syntaxin 1 and SNAP25 is glutamine, which is the single letter amino acid code for which is Q. So, basically, at a point along this um, core snare complex here, so I'll draw this, there is a point along here where the four alpha helices are going to interact with each other, basically. And uh, this point is known as um, the zero ionic layer. So let me just label this up the zero ionic layer. Okay, and basically what's going to happen is that each one of these alpha helices is going to contribute an amino acid, and they're all going to interact, basically. So let's begin with synaptobrevin, which is the odd one out. This one is supplying the arginine. So let me show you the structure of arginine. Okay, so um, start with the basic amino acid structure. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the amino group here. A hydrogen off the alpha carbon there, okay, and then a carboxylic acid group down here. Right. Now, the rest of the arginine group, well, the R group of the arginine, is that you have three methylene groups, so let's continue those on. Three methylene groups, okay. Uh, then you have a nitrogen atom after that, so here's nitrogen with a hydrogen off it. Then you have a carbon, which has an amino group off up here, and then a double bond to a nitrogen and a hydrogen down here. Now, this nitrogen down here, this has a lone pair of electrons here, okay? And basically, protons can come and associate with this lone pair of electrons. They will be attracted to this lone pair of electrons. So you get protons associating with the end of this arginine group, which overall means that this R group of the arginine is going to be given a positive charge by these protons coming and interacting with this lone pair of electrons on this guanadino nitrogen, as it's called. I'll just write that down. This ha has a funny name. It's known as the guanadino nitrogen. Guanadino nitrogen. Okay, now let me draw you the structure of glutamine now, the other amino acid, okay? So, uh, where should I, should I try and squeeze this in down here? Okay, let's put it in here. So, here's the alpha carbon again. Here's the amino group. Okay, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon. The carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, and then glutamine um, has three carbons. Then it has a primary amide group on the end. So, it has an amino group off the carboxylic acid group here. And then it has hydrogens off these carbons here. Okay, so this is glutamine. Glutamine. And the single letter amino acid code for glutamine is that it's called Q. This up here was arginine, and I'll just put that in. Arginine. And the single letter amino acid code for arginine is R. Okay, so what happens then overall? If we look at these four alpha helices, what's going to happen is they're going to form like uh, the four corners of a square, basically. So let's show this. So you're going to have these four corners. Let's say this is one of the alpha helices provided by the SNAP25. This is another alpha helix provided by the SNAP25. Then we'll have our syntaxin 1 over here in blue. And then finally, our synaptobrevin 2 over here. Now, the synaptobrevin 2 will provide its arginine into the centre here, which will have a positive charge, basically. Okay, now, 
glutamine. Look at the terminus of glutamine. It has this amide link. Now you might say, well look, this nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons, it can accept a proton too, so it's going to get a positive charge. Wrong. Nitrogens in amide groups are really, really difficult to protonate. You'd have to put them in a really strong acid solution to actually get this uh, nitrogen atom to adopt a proton, uh, which isn't physiological. In physiology, in physiological, um, what in the physiological conditions, uh, this will not be protonated, and instead. If we look at these oxygen and this nitrogen, they have much greater electronegativities than the carbon. So what this means is that um, in these bonds, these covalent bonds where the carbon and the nitrogen are sharing electrons, the nitrogen and the oxygen nuclei will pull the electrons far more than the carbon nuclei. So the electrons will spend their time in the nitrogen around the nitrogen and the oxygen. So the nitrogen and oxygen gain partially negative charges. So basically the ends of glutamine are partially negatively charged. So basically what's going to happen is you're going to have all these glutamines sort of surrounding the arginine there with a positive charge, and they've all got these partial negative charges, and that's what's known as the uh, zero ionic layer, this interaction between these four amino acids, all of um, the different alpha helices of the diff well, the different alpha helices basically that make up this core snare complex. Okay, and that's why you will see synaptobrevin 2 referred to as an R snare, whilst you will hear um, SNAP25 and syntaxin 1 called Q snares because they provide glutamines, whereas synaptobrevin 2 provides arginines. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.